So uh, we're getting ready to go into some of the performance metrics, some of the standards. Uh, so we'll get into this. I'm going to introduce uh, Scott, who will then take over for the next couple segments. And we will learn all about national performance metrics and how we can get better at delivery and uh, maybe some Q&A on, on how we can help ourselves. So everybody, Scott and Andy. Thanks for having us again. We've kind of changed up our presentation from some of the previous ones. But before we get started, uh, I'm Scott Rattery, Fleet Manager for Michigan Department of Transportation. Andy Banish, our Fleet uh, Management System Analyst. We're going to tag team this today. And then we got Scott Poirier, our Fleet Specialist, sitting in the audience. Basically a recap of uh, where we've been real quickly. And then Andy's going to get into the metrics part. So this is the agenda. A uh, little brief timeline and history of where we've been. Then we're going to talk about where we stand with reporting and remind you that there is a website that EMTSP put together to help us uh, track and uh, show the metrics for everybody. And it has a lot of other data out there as well. And then what our reporting guidelines are. And then Andy's going to get into a little discussion about the NAFA codes. And then each of the five metrics we report, he's actually going to tell you how to report a metric without or metrics without a fleet management system, uh, because we know there's a lot of data out there that you probably already know about your uh, equipment, but you don't have a data system to pull it together. So he's going to simplify this for everybody um, even much more. If you do have a fleet management system that you're able to operate, then that's going to even help you more. And then at the end. When Andy's done with a presentation, he'll take questions, and or I will take questions, and then we've got a slide for some uh, follow-up questions we want to have as part of the discussion, and Scott Poirier's going to be passing a handout to you, kind of another survey, I guess, to fill out that we're going to ask you to complete, but we will, uh, we will step through each of those questions and take uh, uh, feedback from the audience because we're interested in the challenges you may have or some of the issues you may have with that. So we're going to ask you to document that, too, because we want to take all the sheets back. And uh, There's two charts here, and I know these are busy charts, but just want to summarize, particularly for the new people in the room, where we've been. Uh, some folks like Tim have been around a while, so he's been on the ground floor of this as well. But back in 2010, uh, there was a meeting in Pittsburgh, and it had been quite a few years, I believe, since there had been a Northeast or a Midwest conference, and at that time, the, uh, the two regions agreed that we would have joint conferences, and um, that's where there was a heavy discussion about performance metrics, and at that time, Michigan, uh, Michigan DOT said they would step up and help lead that effort. So this has been going on. We're in our ninth year, so it's like a graduate program or PhD program we're working on, but here's the reason we decided to take this on, uh, as well as everybody in the audience, because this is a team effort. A lot of people in this audience participated, and we have participation from the southeast and the west as well. So this isn't just something Michigan did. We couldn't have done it without everybody else helping out. But the following summer, we went to the uh, Northeast Midwest Conference in Kansas City that Tim and his folks graciously hosted. And at that time, we had a lot of uh, um, older heads that were still had not retired and stuff, and we had a lot of experience in the room, and I think we calculated up as probably a couple hundred years of fleet management experience in the room. And I think it was Jim Smith from Pennsylvania said, you know, why do we need to pay somebody to do this? We've got the expertise in the room to do this. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit of our time to do this. So we all agreed that was what was going to happen. So that's what kind of kicked it off, and then the next year, we went to Alabama for a national conference, and we presented with all four regions there. And there was a couple of uh, resolutions that came out of that. One is what we're doing now, which is every other year a region conference, and, and in between that, national conferences. And then there was a resolution, too, on the four measurements we presented to get started uh, with this effort. So after that, there's a lot of information missing on here. We had numerous meetings and and position papers, white papers we put together with support from the other regions to work through how all these metrics were going to be developed, uh, what the guidelines were going to be, uh, and how we could kind of make it uh, standardized for everybody. Because every region out there has different criteria. Either you've created them or your legislature has mandated them. But what we've done is develop a structure to where you can report, still using your criteria, it will just reflect whatever your percentages are 
within the criteria we agreed upon. So we were also asked, we went to a couple of TRBs and made presentations. NC, NCPP helped develop the website uh, that many of you may have been to. We're not gonna review that today, but um, uh, that was very pivotal in getting the data reported and out there so everybody could see it. And then there's been numerous conferences in the last number of years, numerous meetings and all that. And this is just a few of them here. We also, you know, typically provide a, a, an update at the ESCOM uh, meetings every year as well. So, and last year we did one in Hartford. So a lot of the data you're gonna see here may have changed since then. So, so basically, where do we stand right now? We're up to 39 of 50 states reporting. And that's at least one measurement. And that was our goal from the 2014 conference in Florida when we had the initial 17 states reporting because the website had just come up the year before and we figured we would try to double that and get us up to 34 states by the time we had the meeting in Columbus uh, with Doug's group back in 2016. We fell short of that. I think we were about 27 states, but we we picked up since then just through uh, follow-up and uh, uh, continuing to support folks and all that. So you can see those are just some of the metrics and numbers and all that underneath there. Right now, of the 39 states reporting, 23 have actually reported in the last 12 months. We do have some states that haven't reported in a while for various reasons, and, and that's fine. So, so we've made quite a, quite a bit of progress. This is by region, uh, eight of the 11 states in the Northeast and nine of the 13 states in the Midwest have reported. Um, Southeast, nine of 13, and the wild, wild west, man, they got 13 out of 13. So they've, they've been pretty uh, aggressive on that. We try to do a follow-up every year to uh, remind people and, and reach out and provide help because that's one thing MDOT agreed to do with our fortunate situation of having somebody like Andy that can pull all this data together. We have helped at least seven to eight states either figure out how to put their data in a spreadsheet to report the information or actually report it out of their fleet management system. So uh, as you can see at the bottom of the chart there, you know, there's various reasons why people can't report. Most of our offices are pretty small. You got other competing priorities. As we saw yesterday, there's a lot of folks that don't have fleet management systems or they have fleet management systems that they're not happy with and not doing what they need to do. Um, so that's, that's pretty important. Also, the NAFA codes have presented a challenge for some folks. So, um, uh, but we do appreciate everybody's efforts to participate and, and do those type of things. So there is a website. I'm not going to go that today, but if you haven't been out there, I recommend you go to it. Um, it lists every state by region that has reported. There's an information and form site which has uh, benchmarking comparisons and has other data like definition of the metrics, et cetera, where you can get pretty much every, every bit of information you want about this initiative out there. Under each state that has reported at the bottom, there's a link that says supporting documentation. If you do go to Michigan, every one of the presentations we've given on metrics is in that supporting documentation link all the way back to Kansas City. I don't think there was a formal presentation in uh, Pittsburgh that was kind of more of a get together and let's get organized and get moving out. So, And there's, uh, like I said, the state folders, access and updates. Uh, we only have read access. Uh, the folks at NCPP, they, they, they post the information. They make adjustments to the website for us upon request. And the website was developed based on inputs from all the four regions as well. And um, so I would encourage you to go out there. It's, it's a pretty nice website. It's a st in the stoplight configuration, you know, green light, red light, yellow light, uh, based upon the guide, reporting guidelines and stuff. And the reporting guidelines, what the group decided, we pick two times a year, we ask people to report, but you can report anytime, it doesn't matter. We figured every six months, so we pick January and um, July. So that's more open now. We just want folks to report and it's an opportunity to go online and be able to look at what other folks are doing and maybe it would uh, prod some questions you might have about um, what another state's doing or not doing to help you get along. And I know for us in Michigan, it's been very good because it's allowed us to reach out and get to know a lot of other people in other states and communicate with them. And as part of this effort, Andy holds two uh, M5 uh, webinars uh, basically in March, April each year and September of each year to get M5 users together and talk about issues that are going on because that plays a, um, 
a huge, uh, a huge part in this effort. So, um, and there, there is a form that's on the website uh, that you can download the current form to fill in all the information or whatever information you can report. And it should, you should be able to email that information directly to NCPP, but I ask that you, uh, it also populates my name on there, but you send it to me and I send it over to John over there and he gets it posted uh, pretty quickly. So that's kind of um, my update. What Andy's gonna do now is he's gonna talk a little bit about NAFA codes, which is how we match up the groupings of vehicles and equipment because a lot of states do it differently. And then he's gonna go through um, each of the metrics and how we report, report them, show an example, and talk about how you can do it, whether you have a fleet management system or not. Before Andy comes up, but we'll publicly thank him again because this wouldn't be possible without his efforts. As we talked about yesterday, if you have a fleet management system, that's great, but you gotta have a quarterback that executes the plays and does everything they need to do to make it happen, and he's done a great job for us. So he's only available to the highest bidder, and if he wants to move out of Michigan, that's where all his family is. So anyway, I turn it over to Andy. Thank you. Yeah. Now that I'm blushing, um, this is going to be a little bit more detailed than the usual speech Scott gives, uh, but hopefully not too detailed, like kind of a medium detail. Uh, so, so typically, um, over the years when I've talked to people about reporting these national metrics, first thing that comes up is it's really hard to match every single NAFA code to every single unit you have. You know, you have thousands of vehicles and pieces of equipment. There's thousands of NAFA codes. You probably don't use them, and you got to match them up. Well, at MDOT, we never matched one-to-one -one a NAFA code to a piece of equipment. All we did was generally just do light, medium, heavy, non-self-propelled, and off-road and construction. So your, your groups, or however you group your units, you probably have some sort of code in your state. Um, naturally probably follows this. So for example, light is anything under 10,000 GVWR. So that's all your half tons, three quarter tons, minivans, um, and stuff like that. So what we did is I just, just generally all of those, boom, are light. Uh, anything from 10,000 to 26,000 would be medium. Anything heavier than that. So most of your plow trucks, uh, probably all your plow trucks are heavy. Uh, where it gets a little tricky is when you get to non-self-propelled and off-road construction, but as I said, you probably have some sort of grouping in your states, like loaders are in their own group and, and stuff like that. Um, generally, non-self-propelled, as in the name, doesn't move on its own, and off-road construction does move on its own. So stuff like skid steers and loaders, and if you have any hovercrafts out there, that's off-road construction um, and all the other stuff's non-self-propelled. So you just go through and just generally do that. Then you have to match each code one-to-one. -one. I think that would help a lot of people out. People get, people get stuck on the NAFA codes. Um, but if you do want to see what they are, they're on the EMTSP website in the performance metrics section. And there's like a spreadsheet with all the codes. Uh, so we'll go over utilization first. I'll just read the definition quick. It's a measurement typically in hours or mileage to indicate how frequently a vehicle or piece of equipment is used within a given time period. And here is, uh, you can see on, on the screen, is a chart of what MDOTS is, um, if you actually went out to the website. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna establish uh, a standard. Um, I'll give you two examples. At MDOT, winter maintenance trucks are standards 300 engine hours a year. Um, and minivans and cars actually to 10,000 miles a year. Um, once you have your standards for each group, and we don't actually have a standard for everything, so for example, trailers, we don't have a standard for, so we just don't report that group. Um, you would then gather your data, so it, if you have a fleet management system, it most likely gathers it um, every month, quarter, year, in the lifetime. But if you don't have a fleet management system, you get the very least, if you know the mileage of the unit, you can just take, you can just do the total average for the whole life. So in this example, um, you have 110,000 miles for this Impala. It's been in service nine years, therefore it has a little over 12,000 miles on average per year. In MDOT, that would be considered utilized per our standard. Um, and then you simply, once you have that for every single unit, you just take the total that meet the standard and divide it by the NAFA code, um, the total in that whole group, and then you get the percentage uh, that's over, and that's what you would report on the form. And here's an example of what we actually send to our regions. 
So this, this one's probably the most colored report we do, but uh, you can see we do utilization by month and quarter and yearly. Um, the most important being yearly, but if a user wants to know, you know, in December, what's my usage, then you have it. Um, so in the top one, you can see it's green, it's utilized for the year. Uh, third one down is yellow, that means kind of like uh, it's not utilized, so that would be um, not utilized on the report. Preventive maintenance, probably everyone has a report or does this in some fashion. It's a fundamental plan maintenance activity. For example, oil filter cha oil change, uh, designed to improve life and avoid any unplanned maintenance activity breakdown involving a vehicle or piece of equipment. And you can see that's MDOTS right there. This is probably our best metric. Uh, we were pretty poor when we first started reporting this, but, but after significant reporting and sending it to our regions, um, and I'll show you that report in a little bit, that drastically improved to what you see there. Um, so many fleet management systems out there do what's called forecasting. So if you have a fleet management system that does that, it's gonna be probably date-based, so it's gonna take the average, like the average usage that it sees over a time period for a unit, and then, and then kind of predict out, oh, if that person drives like that every single day, this is when that service is gonna do, be due. Um, typically, from what I've found, that's really good for fleets that have very consistent usage. So think of like a bus company and like a, or a bus that goes the same route every single day. You can predict extremely accurately um, when that's actually gonna hit. Uh, MDOT uses just a flat percentage with a, with a custom report I created. Um, our usage is so, so all over the board. Sometimes the person will drive all the way to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and back, then they might not drive too much for the, like the next month. It just, it really throws that metric off. Um, so a flat percentage worked better for us. Uh, but either way, you have units that are or are not compliant. And the date based, if it's over the date, it's not compliant. If it's before the date, it is compliant. In our, in our flat percentage, if it's over 100%, it's not compliant. If it's under 100%, it is compliant. Um, so you just count those up. Uh, so you take the total that are compliant, because that's what we want to report, what is compliant, um, and divide it by the total number of units in that code and you get your percentage. And here is actually what is sent to all of our users every Monday morning. A um, Couple hundred people get this, and it just tells them, so you see the first one, uh, what is that, 98%, uh, so it's, that person would probably get that done really soon. The one after that, the two after that are overdue. Um, so you can see a green one would be compliant, red or yellow would be not compliant for us. Scheduled versus unscheduled, uh, an accurate measurement of scheduled preventive versus unscheduled corrective, and that's those are the keywords, preventive and corrective. Allows managers and supervisors to track effectiveness of preventive maintenance programs. You can see our, our little uh, graph right there, that's what, how we were when I took this picture. Um, so the first thing you need to do for this, and this is, uh, takes a little bit more work, you need to determine what you consider scheduled and unscheduled. And before you even do that, you probably have to pick a code you want to use. You can use a job code or a task code or whatever you want to use. At MDOT, we use a code that applies to the entire work order. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. So after you pick that, then you'd have to determine which of those codes are considered scheduled, which are considered unscheduled. But basically, scheduled means preventive maintenance or something you're gonna do before it breaks down. And unscheduled, in my mind, is a, just a flat breakdown. Um, so when I run this report, it's basically telling us how many breakdowns do we have. <clears throat> so so you, what you do is add all the scheduled work orders, because that's what we want to report, and divide it by the total number in that NAFA code. And that's going to tell you, you know, how many, what your percentage of scheduled is. So this is, how, this is how we send it out to our regions, a little bit different, but we do it by the number of jobs, and by the labor, and by the cost just in case someone was curious. Um, the cost is kind of important when you're considering outsourced, uh, just when you're doing it internally, but for the national metric, you probably just want to count each work order. We like doing it by work order, because then we know, um, even, if it's, even if, it's, if it's a breakdown, we still might do like a preventive maintenance, but really that whole, that whole time period is considered a breakdown because, because um, it interrupted service. Uh, availability downtime, so availability is when a unit is in service 
and capable of performing at a minimum its primary function. And downtime is when obviously it's unavailable and unable to perform its primary function. We see we're pretty good on this one. Um, so that's our stoplight. So some fleet management systems track downtime. Probably most of them do. Um, I'm gonna show you how to track it if you don't have a fleet management system or you, your system doesn't track it. MDOT reports their time 24 seven. So we track downtime 24 seven. A lot of the systems out there will let you pick, uh, let's say, like, well, our system calls it, I believe, maintenance downtime, so like eight to five, Monday through Friday. Um, we decided to use 24 seven because we could technically use the vehicle anytime. It's also a lot easier to calculate than, than trying to figure out what the availability is from eight to five. Uh, so in this example, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if you don't have a fleet management system or you don't know how to calculate it, if you take that Excel formula and put it and, and put your data in there, then it will tell you the number of days that the vehicle is down. So in the example, uh, let's see, if you have the work order open date in column A and the closed or completed date in column B and you stick that formula in column C, it will tell you how long it's down. Um, so if you don't have a fleet management system, you can use that to help you figure it out. Uh, you can use this, you can use this, you can use any, any time period you want, so days, hours, or seconds. Um, interesting fact, our fleet management system uses milliseconds, which is a very common programming trick. Uh, so you, I have to divide it by 3.6 million to actually get hours. So to calculate, and this is the tricky part, because we're actually talking, we're actually reporting availability and not downtime. To calculate that, you need to take the number of hours down and divide it by the number of hours that are available in the time period that you want. So in this example, we have a vehicle that's, 38 hour, that's down 38 hours in a month. And since we're talking about a month, that's 720 hours. Um, so that's 5% downtime if you do the math. So your availability would be 95%. That's what we want to report is availability because it's, a, as I've been told, a more positive metric than downtime. Um, so then you know, to get the average, just take the total time available divided by the total time for that whole NAFA category, and that gives you, you know, what you would put on the form. But this one's a little trickier because you actually have to figure out, you know, if you want to report it in a whole year, that's going to be a lot more hours than a whole than a month. So you got to figure out um, what time period you're talking about. But either way, you can report it. And this is what we actually send out quarterly to our regions and business areas. You can see we have both availability and downtime. And this one's pretty, pretty flat. But sometimes, you know, if a region doesn't have a lot of units. It could really go up and down. They could see um, that they've had a lot of downtime. So replacement recommended uh, measurement to compare whether an individual vehicle or piece of equipment are within or exceed or established criteria, typically in months or years of age, um, for the expected life cycle. And there's our graph. Uh, a lot of this is driven by your purchasing, because it's basically what we're talking about is replacing units and, and what your, your own schedule is for replacing them. This is the actual easiest to report. You can do it entirely in Excel. I actually did it for one of the states when they just sent me a raw data dump of all their units and, and when they, expect, and they wanted to replace them. Um, I forgot what state it was, but they're reporting one metric, I believe. Um, so you can do it all in Excel. There's the formula. So you need the following fields. You basically need to know your life cycle, when you, when you expect to replace. So for example, MDOT's um, winter maintenance trucks, our life cycle is 10 years. Our minivans are five years. So that's when we, that's the, the benchmark we set to try and replace them. And you also need to know how many years in service, and that formula will tell you that right there. So to calculate it in Excel, um, and it's pretty much as easy to do in Excel as it is in a report, uh, you would just take your years in service, and you have your retention term there, you stick that formula in column D, and it will tell you in months how long it's been, and then you just subtract it. So in this example, this minivan is over by 59 months. Um, so we're 59 months past our retention, so that would not be compliant. So what you would do is take the total number of units that are past its life cycle and divide by the number of units in that NAFIC category code. And this is what we send to our regions. This is a really simple one. It's just, just lines of text. So you can see anything in negative that's red is past retention. Anything that's positive in black is not past retention. And we just count those up and, and do the percentage.
Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.